and we are recording. Hello. Hi. Hello. God, so enthusiastic. Hello, Harvey. <laughs> hello, Sam. Hello. Hello, hello. Welcome to uh, the In Your Own Words blog. Uh, welcome to In Conversation With. Thank you both for doing this. This is going to be, uh, I'm very excited. I'm very uh, intrigued about what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is a, 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 a first for my blog. The fact that we have two people in in the in the conversation, and also Sam Warble, you are the first person to appear in two separate interviews. Uh, I feel honoured. It's a uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a historic moment uh, to say the least. Um, <laughs> so how how are you? How, so first of all, before we before we get into the nitty gritty of things, um, how how are you both doing um, under under lockdown? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, good. It's it's getting a bit long at this point, and it really is the main thing for me. Um, but yeah, I've been all right, uh, keeping busy and um, staying with the parents at the moment. So that's all good, and you know, nice to. It's kind of it's kind of weird. It's like I had a lockdown birthday, but normally my birthday is during like exam season and that. So I've not seen my parents my past like three birthdays or whatever because I've always been busy. So it's it's been cool, but at the same time would kind of like to go back to normality as soon as possible but it looks like that might be a while away to be honest how about you sam yeah not nothing nothing too different um sort of just relaxing protect perfected my setup of uh for, for streaming start streaming a bit which is nice um, oh, cool. but uh sort of seeing how the, the day takes us Basically. What, do you want to plug your your? Uh, nah, no one, no one, no one wants, no one wants to watch that. Thanks. That is not the attitude. What, what are you, what are you streaming out of interest? We just play like it's a couple of mates from Dodgeball. It's just like League of Legends, Valorant, which is a new FPS at the moment. Yeah. Um, Team Fantastics. So it's just whatever we fancy at the moment. Um, we get a bit of money from it and can't complain really. Having a bit of fun. I've heard so much about Valorant. One of my my best friends from home got the the beta key uh, yeah. before it was released, and he, he loves it. He, he plays it all the all the while. Do, are you enjoying it? Yes, it's a good game. It's um, it's it's very buggy. I feel like they they should have taken some more time to perfect things. But it's a fun game. I enjoy it, even though I'm absolutely trash at it. So. Uh... <laughs> Very good then, very good. Okay then, so today obviously we're going to talk uh, very generally about the esports industry, uh, an industry that to many people, including myself, uh, it's quite new, it's quite alien, you know, it's only within these last few years that I've started learning more about the industry and I'm realising how big the industry is. Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. So, Let's start off then. So, like I said, the industry might seem quite alien to a lot of people at the moment, but could you both just kind of give an introduction to fundamentally what esports is? Um, yeah, I suppose it's it's competitive video games, right? So, video games played at the highest level, um, generally speaking streamed or you know shown in an arena to other people. I suppose there's a big conversation, like you say, it's a very young industry. So there's a big conversation about what is esports. I have a few friends who are really into gaming and maybe don't follow it as much. That so would be like, uh, if I'm playing with some mates and we've got a bit of a competition between the four of us or whatever, that's an esport. And then I'd kind of be like, well, I think maybe money needs to be involved and, um, you know, it needs to have like a, a, an element of almost at least that that hard kind of competition where it runs on for a bit longer and there's a structured tournament and brackets and stuff like that um but yeah at its core like fundamentally it is it is highly competitive video games i suppose yeah I, I, for me it's just very much like like traditional sport it's just that for online games and fps's and things it's what people have done for years is to form the team try to be the best try to fight other people it's just as harvey said it's just that structured format with people analyzing it people because there's all the coaches and the analysts and the commentators and the journalists that all surround said um uh, the, all the, the games as well yeah because now obviously it's now a, a multi-billion 
pound industry globally, you know, it, it is massive now. But but how long has it taken to get to where it is now? Has it been a, a very sort of long process? Well, well the, the ace balls have been around for decades, um, especially in Korea um, and things like StarCraft have been around for 20 plus years. Um, and things like Unreal Tournament, um, even... Uh, the people say like the origin of esports is like uh, people who used to meet up to play like on like big arcade games like old Donkey Kong like the world championships for those those were like the original esports and those have been going on for like 30 years um, so but when pe I'd say when people think of like modern day esports it's more like 5 10 15 years old mm. so it's still it's still relatively new but it's getting there yeah yeah so yeah, I still, think, um, sorry so no, go ahead Tom, yeah sorry. that's all right i was just um gonna come in and say like it, it's so cs is like the game that i work on mostly and that's having like its 21st anniversary from its original like it's had a couple different versions but from the original version in like a week or so it's going to be 21 so Wow, um, and that that started pretty quickly into the esports, as far as I'm aware. So yeah, it, it has been, I think, a little longer than people perhaps realise. Twenty one years. That's um, I, I would never ever have guessed that. That's that's that's, that's insane. That's actually insane. That's a long time. Yeah. It's good. It is good. And and like I think what Sam was touching on a little bit in like the late nineties in Southeast Asia, they had like a recession in the entertainment industry or something so they started putting esports because it's cheap and you don't have to pay like talent and players and stuff as much or whatever um they started putting that on tv so it like kind of exploded out there that makes sense um how big would you both say competitive gaming is here in in the uk um i mean obviously bbc and now announced that they'll be showcasing the league of legends uh uk Tournament, which, which is big isn't it i mean that, that must oh, be yeah. quite big for the industry yeah it's, it is very big um the bbc have done bits before but not until this level they did um they did worlds when it was in paris um last year they covered that <laughs> a bit um but the the scene in the uk isn't huge compared to other places um it's it's trying to get going and there is some talent coming out of it um but it's as a country we're not really um set for it at the moment i don't think it's it's on its ways there and i could see it becoming a big thing but there's still like leaps and bounds it needs to do i think um crowds and events and things in in uh the uk can be quite good but in terms of like the actual because obviously we kind of have that you know like football and if there's a bit of alcohol involved it's good fun <laughs> i think quite a uh a, a, a well-known one was like um when the the cod league started when that got all franchised and everything and and um a bit more i guess we talk about that structure it got like a really heavy structure to it um i think they had one of their first things in in london and, and it was really popular but in terms of yeah like playing as it were like the the teams and whatnot um it can be a bit again like where i come from in in cs i think league is a little more solid actually like they have some decent players and give it a couple of years maybe they'll be building more talent but like in cs it's been very very difficult um for the uk and and there's this whole issue with like egos everywhere and you know these young 16 to 18 year olds who have talent but they're really difficult to play with or they have one tournament that goes poorly and then they just disband the team you know and all that kind of stuff so there's a lot of that going on um that i think makes it difficult to find like stability as it were the the, the with the uk scene there is a lot of um a lot of teams a uk based um so one of the the big teams is called Fnatic. It's, it's a big esports team across many m multiple esports um, and their their owners based in the UK they've got a lot of training facilities in the UK um, but as Harvey said there's not a lot of UK players that I off the top of my head I can think about four maybe UK players um, 
which is, is actually in terms of things isn't bad for the the, the European scene. Um, at one time, we we were the second highest contributor to the the league UK scene for, from the UK league UK scene uh, players wise, but I think that's slipped a bit recently. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Um, and another kind of point on that, I want to come on to. Obviously, now, uh, and I must admit, when I first encountered this, I I was kind of blown away a bit by this actually. But more universities now are investing into esports, aren't they? And I'm obviously talking. All three of us obviously studied at uh, University of Leicester. Um, recently, obviously, they've invested a lot of money into their their esports lab. Um, you know, in in in, in the library. Um, how do you both respond to this then, that esports is potentially coming into sort of um, like, like university competitions, just like anything like uh, like rugby and football and uh, Quidditch? I mean, maybe if you want to have that in the same conversation, I don't know if that's, you know, worthy of being in the same conversation. You know, but how, how, how do you kind of respond to this movement? Uh, when, when, people, uh, yeah, when people compare the two... Um, the, I always uh, there's there's an interview which I'd highly recommend watching by Nick Fox, who is a um, NBA player, was an NBA player, but now he's made that transition into esports, um, and he he owned a te- he used to own a team. Um, there was a lot of drama surrounding that. Um, I read about the drama. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, my, my 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 knowledge of esports is little, but for some reason, I've I've read a lot about all the dramas in esports because I find that really interesting. I read a lot about um, yeah. about Nick. Yeah. It was yeah, it was a really it, as a fan, it was very frustrating because um, I really liked his team and he, he him himself had such a passion for the sport because it all it all came from. Um, him trying to connect with his son um so he bought this team this league team and he was at every single event and you'd always see him on front row he'd give him high fives to all the players and it was really nice to watch to see this massive nba star come in and give esports like a, a proper fighting chance but as i'm saying there's there's an interview where someone asked him that question and he's, he's saying about how people at the highest level are still that need to train so much and do so much work it's and it's physically like taxing on people so it's I, i'd still i'd put it on the same level you have to give it the same respect that you'd give to other sports because uh, it just it to be at this top level it is so much work like a, a lot of older generations seem to have this opinion of Oh, um, oh, they're just playing video games for fun. They're just going to sit down what, for like two hours, and they're going to be like top ten in the world or whatever. And this, it's really not. You have to, you have to dedicate yourself to play this. Um, yeah. I think I'm just, I'm just sort of trying to think. It's like when I was at Leicester, I, I was on the um, uh, the esports society in like second year, right on on the committee. Um, and it was it was kind of it was a little difficult because we couldn't get access to the uh, uni's like network, so setting up um, tournaments and things like to have lots of people offline like come with their own gear or whatever and and have a, a good time. So we ended up having to buy like consoles and work it that way and and kind of do it with like controllers or do stuff online where people were at home, which doesn't quite have the same the same vibe. So and it was kind of annoying because DMU have like one of the biggest esports societies in the country um in terms of like their their membership and the facilities that they they had at the time so it's kind of good to hear that eventually they've come around and they've started helping out and i guess the the guys that are on the esports society at the moment are probably um facilitating that but as well it's just kind of like another thing it's another thing that's part of the cell for for joining leicester for example you know as a university that they have now um, got themselves like a, an esports angle in the same way that you might go somewhere else because they have a really good rugby team or whatever, right? Um, so I think I think it's good that people and uh, unis are paying attention, and it gives like another avenue. People might go. There are a lot of people who, again, particularly in the UK, want to try and make it, but you have to also because I kind of did as well. I finished my degree and everything. There's a few guys that I commentate with and whatnot that dropped out or have opted not to go to uni at all. Um, 
and and you know you're taking a bit of a risk with that in the hopes that everything works out and, and whatnot and even in the long run you build up like because that was kind of my idea is if i have a degree maybe i commentate for like 10 years travel the world blah blah, blah have a great time but then i get a bit too old right there are a lot of guys at the moment who are pushing into their 30s that have got families and you know going back and forth to america and australia and all around europe is kind of difficult when you have like a two three-year-old kind of thing um so it's good that you can perhaps now i guess do both if you want to become a player or even a commentator right you can start here that's kind of where i started in the university scene so um it's good now that that people have options and maybe don't have to take as massive risks uh to follow to follow the dreams i guess in um the, the, there's a th uh, in in denmark especially there's a lot of safety nets and um i wouldn't say like training programs but in denmark they're a lot more liberal with the whole esports uh, society and they take it a lot more seriously so um if you wanted to drop out of school to um pursue this like passion there's a lot of support and like payment and everything to make sure that if you are good enough you are you do go through all this and this is why like Denmark's probably the second best country for esports players in the world uh, only after Korea um, a lot of the best League of Legends players come out of Denmark um, just because they have this safety the, this whole like regime around it to actually allow people to follow their dreams without having to as Harry said, sort of like take that risk and almost lose everything if it doesn't work out. Wow, that's fascinating. That's that's really fascinating. Denmark of all places. Denmark, yeah. Wow. Yeah, they, they have um, some of the best CS players as well. So there you go, right? Like they have teams, four or five teams in the top like 20 teams in the world. So, and then again, we're here in the UK kind of struggling, you know, to break a team into like the top 50. So there's like one team at the moment that, that is kind of doing good work. So it's kind of interesting, right? You have like a, a government even that, that really cares and it translates. The, the players are really good. So, you know, mm -hmm. certainly something I think other countries could learn from. It's interesting you were saying about um, going back to your point about the training, Sam. Uh, obviously, when I, when, I work, when I have to work in the library overnight uh, on night shifts and stuff like that, the eSports lab is uh one of the few places that i'm actually not allowed to go into or anything now because we're, we're told that the students that go into the esports lab they're there to train and they can't be disturbed and we can't be going in unless obviously a, there's a fire alarm or something serious you know we're, we're not allowed to disturb them and it's interesting because if i am working the night shift in the library or something <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> They'll come in. They'll come in at around you know eight eight p.m. nine p.m. and they'll stay in there all the way through, you know, till the early morning. It's proper proper training. Yes, it, the the good thing about esports that they do generally have over um, other sports is you can train at any time you want. Um, you can, if you wanted to, you can work through the night. You can, whereas it might be hard to like train with your team. Uh, or whatever if you are say like a rugby player you can't exactly go out onto the rugby pitch at 4am um there is there is that thing of trying to keep the balance though um a lot of um league teams are investing in like personal trainers and well-being people to make sure that they are being looked after they do get up at a reasonable time they they eat well they go to the gym they train they go to bed at a reasonable time um so it, as it, it, there is the benefit of like you can work at any time but there is also that sort of downside of is it healthy to sort of be awake at f 10 hours or whatever at night when you probably should be asleep so you have to sort of take both sides of the the coin for that yeah mental health is a big one at the moment as well um uh, talk about these these danish players the best team in the world uh, in, in CS is Astralis um, and a really, really big organization out in Denmark as well. Like it's wild. They have people queuing for miles to, you know, get their new jerseys. And I think they had like um, some kind of a, a deal going on with McDonald's at one point and they have like Jack and Jones as a sponsor. They've brought in a lot of like non-endemic brands into esports and stuff. Um, but they're, uh, 
so what is called an in-game leader, who's the guy that kind of calls all the strategies within a game. So generally does a bit of deeper work into other teams to learn what they do and, and whatnot. So it can be quite intense. Um, and then and then one of their star players, they've both taken time off for like burnout, right? Because they've been working so hard. Astralis have been at the top level, if not the top team for like two, two and a half years now. So it's it's very, very hard to to keep that up and to kind of come back. They have peaks and troughs, you know, every now and then. Uh, Astralis have gone missing for a few months, but they will always bounce back, right? Um, and these two guys have taken time off because they're just worried about their mental health. And it, it, it comes out, it turns out, there's been a big article by um, one of the big journalists uh, in, I'd say, all of esports. Richard Lewis is, is a really good guy if you want to learn about um, some very integral journalism, uh, investigative, investigative, sorry, uh, journalism. Um and uh, it kind of turns out that a bit of that comes from the organization wanting them to play as much as possible and, you know, keep it up and keep bringing the money in from all different aspects, winning tournaments and branding and all that kind of stuff. And um, they had to, like, go to doctors or whatever and, and get, like, a proper official can't ignore this note uh, in order to get some time off. So it's it's a little, little crazy in that sense, uh, I think. It's another thing to consider. And f f physical health is as well. Um, mm. th the there is a lot of um, injuries, especially wrist injuries, which you sort of um, you sort of guess. Um, but uh, on the, the the side of mental health, um, the best le one of the best League of Legends players in the world, Uzi, who was just classified as probably the best. Um, it's called an AD carry. It's just a position, um, but he was just. He, for for years and years, he's been uh, in the conversation for best AD carry or best AD carry in the world. Uh, he's just retired um, due to pretty much burnout, um, not having the, the the motivation to do it anymore. Um, and it's it, a lot of people are sad to see him go because he was he was a, a generally nice person, and he, he inspired a lot of pros have come out and said. He's the reason I play esports. He's the reason I'm as good as I am because I wanted to be him, and to sort of lose this big figure um, is is a is a big hit. Um, and with, with like the um, injury side, um, with the wrist injuries, people generally like lose their careers over it. So if you don't look after yourself, um, you could permanently injure yourself and not be able to play a game that you probably do love. Uh, a, a, a quite famous case is um, the best EU League of Legends team, G2. Um, MSI, which is the mid-season cup, um, was this time about a year ago. Um, they had to uh, take out one of their starting players because he had a wrist injury. And um, it, it was a big thing because um, it was like, can he play? Can he actually play? Because we want them to do really well and you're starting, say, a People, what people would say, like a, a lower tier support, um, but he eventually but he came back after having this sort of couple of games off and was like, oh yeah, I'm fine, and they ended up winning the whole thing. So it is, you need, do need to look after yourself so you can be at that peak performance. <clears throat> yeah, because without, um, <clears throat> without sounding a bit like a boomer here, uh, you know, compared to compared to other sports, obviously esports can't be that healthy for your body. Uh, sorry, competitive gaming, sorry, can't be that healthy for your body. You know, looking at screens, taking in all the blue light, you know, obviously I imagine their posture is not very good as they play. Um, and, you know, I imagine over, over time, the body, their bodies, you know, like it's, it's good. It's good. What I'm getting at is that it's, it's good to hear that the teams do take care of their players and they are putting them through, you know, proper fitness regimes and things as well, because, you know, I'd hate to think that, you know, they'd go into this career they love, come out whenever they come out, and then as the years go by, they just turn into like a sort of, um, like a golem sort of like creature because they're, they're by their body's so used to like, you, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, there's, it's, it's fun to look at some of the, the um, actual league, of, league players because um, usually just like associate them with a name, but recently it's a lot of, actually branding for themselves and everything if you look at a lot of new players and everything they're hench 
they could beat me up like no doubt like they are peak performance like they all and they all go to the gym together they're all lifting weights together just to keep so they don't get this the, 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 as a thing like where they're literally physically they can't do it anymore they 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 do keep they do look after themselves wow so yeah I mean, for, for um a lot of them i think that is part of it like the determined because again it comes down to like mental like obviously the physical health is something to really consider and, and that's part of why you go to the gym but also your mental health and i think a lot of them see it as a bit of an escape um because some of these guys really do work hard and they kind of need something to uh, wind down that also has benefits you know and and a lot of them do spend uh, a good amount of time in the gym some maybe not so much and also need to you know there's there's one the team <laughs> that uh, i always look to there's a team uh, complexity which is like a really old um organization been around for a while um and there's like blame f who's one of their players who's this danish guy with like biceps as big as your head and then uh there's like obo who is stick thin bless him um, and he's very <laughs> he's very young he's he's great though the thing is like that's one of the things as well it's like esports can can almost be seen as um kind of the most meritocratic you know there are some footballers for example who are just never going to be as good as messi or ronaldo because they don't have the natural uh, stamina perhaps right something along those lines that you just kind of unfortunately lost the the genetic uh, lottery but in esports uh, sure you have reflexes that comes into play but it's not always the case um so like that doesn't necessarily make you the best of the game right so I think it's kind of interesting that yes, there are all these guys who are really physically fit, but it doesn't necessarily give them the biggest advantage over people who who aren't who spend their time, you know, doing other things. That's a that's a really good angle, actually. It's a really interesting angle. I've never thought about that before, and and you you know you're bang on. I suppose yeah, because obviously in in other more physical sports like football and rugby and stuff, you know, genetics and your your biological makeup really does play a, a big part you know um it, it, in playing but i suppose yeah on esports it is quite level ground isn't it i suppose it's uh, yeah there's there is a bit of um you have to be smart you have to be really smart for esports and very quick quick uh quick-minded um i think the probably the best way to describe it is um it's there's a, there's a certain esports mentality of like you need to you need to be able to think on your feet and adapt to the situation uh, there's a lot of um the people get let sort of left behind because it's it is a very quick changing scene uh, well especially for league um the i suppose not so much for like csgo and everything but the, there's a thing called like a meta and it, that changes so quickly that it's what's good and what's not you need yeah. to be so be able to adapt to it and be able to read what's good and what's not so you're not just sort of left behind in the dirt like everyone else so you need you need that sort of mental edge the the, <laughs> the games that i enjoy playing you you guys will probably look down on you know i i'm very i very much every single year by fifa uh, i play a lot of apex legends and, and things like that at the moment you know very commercial games i suppose aren't for real gamers if you know what i mean like they're the sort of games i play but but you're talking about the meta you know every every year me and my friends that play fifa we always go out to find what the meta is so we're you know steps ahead of everyone else uh, when when we are playing together in putting pro clubs and stuff like that you know I, I i i try not to lock down on sort of other games it's sort <laughs> of like i feel like everyone's in it together kind of thing like you, you can't be being like oh yeah i love this video game but this video games this other video games um just not as good or whatever in my eyes so i don't like it whoever plays it is bad it's more of uh, if it gives you entertainment and you enjoy what you're doing i don't see a problem in the slightest yeah it's, it's kind of interesting because i think like um fifa for example uh, Apex is kind of a difficult one. I mean, it's it's a pretty decent game, but in terms of like an esport, the the genre of it, like the battle royale, has been a bit difficult to get off the ground because there's a lot of like randomness to it with like loot spawns and stuff like that. But FIFA is is kind of this esport that, um, amongst the gaming community, 
like it has its following, but it's not necessarily super, super popular um, compared to the other games we've been talking about. But like for these, as I kind of mentioned earlier, like the, the non-endemic brands, right? So like football teams and things, they really want to get involved because it's not violent. It's obviously based on kind of something they already know about. Um, so there's a lot more of, of that going on where they have slightly bigger sponsors and there was something like last year it's it's, it's really weird it's really weird because there was something last year it was like the e-premier league right and they had like um a bunch of teams uh, like actual football teams sponsoring out you know picking up players being fanatic x man united or whatever it was right i didn't follow it super closely but the aftermath of it is there was there was no prize pool for the e-premier league you got everything like paid for and you know flown out to the finals and all that kind of stuff but you didn't it was just like bragging rights or whatever. Um, so it was, it was really strange in that sense, because that's generally speaking, something that, you know, goes hand in hand with esports is you have your event, you have all your um, pomp and circumstance with the broadcast and whatnot, and then a hundred K to the winner or whatever, right? That's part of the sell of getting involved in esports as a, as a player is, is that you can earn some good money if you're the best of the best. So uh, it, it was sort of strange, but it is this very friendly game um but then it doesn't get and it's the same with like cod for example right like cod has such a casual player base um and they have such great broadcasts and everything but they don't quite get the same uh, viewership and and following and whatnot as some of the other esports um but then again that has like kind of cool sponsors coming in because although violent it's maybe like more arcadey than cs there's a whole thing about in cs they're called terrorists and counter terrorists right and then there's blood everywhere and it's kind of part of the game it's hard to remove it and we've touched on valorant a little bit that's where like valorant comes in um but yeah i think i think don't knock yourself too much you know fifa fifa's <laughs> up there fifa is up there for sure um as a, as a pretty good esport I think, I suppose, I mean, obviously you might disagree with me, but I suppose it comes a bit into this kind of PC gaming versus console gaming debate, obviously, that, and it never ends, you know, it will never end, it goes on forever, but obviously I don't, I don't have a game in PC, and I, if I did have a game in PC, I wouldn't ever come off it, <laughs> you know, I'd be on it all the time, you know, so, but I kind of accept that because I am a console gamer, they, these are going to be the sorts of games I play, you know, uh, but I kind of accept that esports i suppose is more for the pc gamer and more for these games that are much more um they're much richer and much more much more developed than th these kind of console games if you know what i mean it, i think it i think it's down a lot to like replayability as well the um with with fifa and everything there's only sort of the, you know obviously who's best and everything and you sort of go through everyone like that and you sort of play your team or whatever um with league and everything there's a lot of no two matches will ever be the same you could th there was a a, a game uh, a couple of months ago there was um it was, it was a semi-final so it was like best of three they did they picked one comp um like a certain set of champions um against each other they played it out and then say team a, team e uh, team a won but then they literally played exactly the same champions again and got a different result and it's like okay uh, how did you do this obviously the one team's come into it and said oh we want to play this we think this is good didn't sort of work out for us first time so let's do it again and it is changed and everything um and uh, i think the reason why league, why league is so popular is you don't need you don't actually need a gaming pc to play it uh, that's a lot of the marketing is that it's you can play it on a sort of laptop me and my mate ethan used to play next to each other sat on our laptops and we used to play on chat pads which is not a good idea um because it's it's just you can't play with it but it's the you, people used to go around other people's houses with their laptops and just sending us to each other and just play league um you just need an internet connection and uh, it's why it's so popular nowadays is just because you there's so first it's so the ease of access of it yeah, I think um, for me, it's like on, on what you were saying, Josh, the lines, I think, um, are starting to blur between that, right? Like a casual and a hardcore kind of player base. Originally, I think they were the the cells, right? Like PCs, you really have to put time into like building one and 
learning how to um, sort your games out and download patches and all that. Like there was no integrated patching and stuff for, for quite a while. You'd have to go and wait and there'd be a queue or whatever um, because they could only let so many people download at once and whatnot. And then consoles were like plug and play, put in some, I don't know, credit card details and you've got access to our internet services. Um, go have fun on like Halo or whatever would be like a classic kind of game. <laughs> so it's like the, the casual versus the, the hardcore, right? Um, and I think now the lines are starting to blur a little bit more. It's, it's so much easier to, you know, build a PC. You could probably do it with very basic guidance um, and whatnot. And um, like everything is there and, you know, the stores and the digital downloads and blah, blah, blah are all the same across the board. Um, and then on consoles, you do have like developers feeding into the kind of more hardcore, like competitive elements with ranked systems and um, games that are maybe slightly harder or games that that's all they're about really is, you know, winning um, in, in a competitive environment. Whereas for like the longest time, it felt like it was pretty much just COD and, and Halo, I guess, every year on, on consoles. There wasn't as much. Um, and even then, they were kind of like a, a more casual vibe. So I think like there is still this, a lot of it does come down to that, um, that, you know, some of the games I touched on, like FIFA and COD and stuff, are primarily console games. Um, and you do still have quite a big casual market just because maybe that, you know, they can be, cheaper and still are easier because it is just plug and play you don't have to like build anything or whatever um but i think there is definitely an argument for like people who want to get involved in in the hardcore scene on consoles definitely can and then people who want to you know build a pc because maybe there's a few games that i don't know something like civ or whatever like civilization is a pc only title but doesn't really it's a bit of a time sink but you don't have to spend that much time learning it you kind of just play it and and have a good time and it's like nice and fun and there's there's no uh, hardcore community gonna flame you or whatever if you're doing things wrong so um sure, i think you can still have like a lot of fun on pc well yeah exactly exactly okay very good then okay so uh, so moving on then in the uh, in the conversation um do you both feel like there's any challenges that, that face esports at the moment? And, and, and if there are no kind of prevalent challenges, I mean, that's fine. It's just, uh, you know, something that we don't often think about. You know, are there issues facing the, the industry? The, the, I don't know. I, I have the privilege of looking, always looking at the, the biggest and the best esports. The, the not the best the 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 most wide uh, watched one um, of league because league is literally the world's um, most watched game it's always at highest on like twitch and everything um, so I don't tend to see the sort of um, struggles that maybe lesser well-known titles get um, because I tend to watch like the 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 best the, the most money and the best production. Yeah, yeah, that um, makes sense. That makes sense. There's there's, there's always the, the there's a lot about the, the like stigma of esports still. Um, even mentioning like esports, it's like I don't know. It's, it tends to be like for me, it's a bit of a like tainted word because um, it's say if if you say you're into esports, everyone's sort of people who don't know the scene as well will probably just look at you a bit like oh. You, what you so you, you sort of sit in your and watch other people play video games and it's like yeah pretty much that's the gist of it but it's obviously there's a whole community around it um but apart from that i can't think of anything that's like uh prevalent at the moment for me um i think yeah some some touch on a really big one right the stigma is always there but um I suppose coming in from CS, part of something that's a little bit different uh, uh, than, for example, League, right, and where a lot of games are going at the moment is uh, the way that Valve, who who are the developers of CS, run their esports scene is they're very kind of hands-off. They let it evolve naturally, right? Um, so it has a very open circuit system uh, and and 
therefore this kind of leads to a, a few different things. There's a lot of competition. Competition is always healthy. Um, there are some really big companies that have been doing it for years. And then there are new ones that come along that are kind of fresh and bring original things to the, to the table, like uh, an event that's going on um, at the moment is a, a company called we play and they have this whole thing where they have like themes and whatnot going on so with it being summer they have like a tropical island theme and whatnot um so that's kind of cool but then uh, there's been a massive conversation this year about like the longevity of cs because a lot of esports orgs take Fnatic, for example um lose money every year they're, they're reliant on investors um, to, to jump into the esports scene and to kind of give them uh, the, the cash flow, as it were. So, and, and CS tends to be, for a lot of these organizations that have multiple teams, um, tends to be their biggest cash sink, as it were. So it's, it's kind of difficult in that sense, finding like a, a longevity. I think League do a really good system the american you know uh, sports system of like franchising and stuff where you have to buy your spot and um can sell your spot for quite a lot and things like that um it's kind of hard because some of them have been really blown out of proportion the overwatch league and the cod league both owned by uh, blizzard are way too much it's like 25 million dollars a spot for the overwatch league um and after two seasons it's it's really dwindling really not doing well but then it's kind of weird because they sold their viewership rights to youtube so even though they're not getting as many people watching it as say league of legends or um cs because they've initially sold it like when you stream to twitch you do it for free like they don't pay you uh for that service you have to make money other ways if you're a tournament organizer so that it's it's really interesting like trying to find an ecosystem that works that is like sustainable um and like i say for cs particularly that's a really big thing because valve have said in the past you know exclusivity leagues no thanks get rid of them we have had one this year called flashpoint that was like a buy-in league for a two million buy-in did clash with a competitor but it wasn't completely exclusive um and unfortunately, that got all messed up. They were going to be, you know, they had a really good talent team with a lot of veterans, some from different esports. Um, like Sam will recognize Monte Cristo was going to be a part of that, um, who used to work in league and, and whatnot. So a bit of a pivot for him. And then, of course, you know, the, the virus like came along <laughs> and, um, and messed all that up, unfortunately. So they had to kind of make due with, with what, they, what they had. Um, but I would say a major issue if you are a business if you are um, a tournament organizer or a team owner or whatever is finding this longevity in esports and actually being able to stick around um, and at the moment for a lot of them it is a battle of finding the investors i mentioned complexity earlier they've got like the dallas cowboys as as an investor right um but there is going to come a time where some of these investors are going to go okay i've lost money on this for four or five years I'm out. And then this team's like, okay, what do we do now? So there's a bit of a, um, like a really quick struggle at the moment to try and find, you know, the sustainability. And you have all these different organizations going about it in different ways, streamers, um, and, and influencers and stuff like that. A hundred thieves, they have a few esports teams, but they're ultimately like a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. You know, they do all their merchandising in, in, um, drop shipping and everything. So that's kind of a cool way. And then you have, places like Fnatic who have a lot of people on board many many teams and try and grow their brand by just being everywhere right um, and then you have Astralis where they're in a, a, a good country for esports and they make their money by being the best in the world at what they do and they only I'm pretty sure they only have a CS team um, so, so they, um, they they're partnered with a league team um, oh, okay. Okay. They're, they're, they're not there's there's this whole thing of like identity with like um like esports teams and everything and so astralis is like the biggest name in like csk um uh, whereas they've partnered with a team called origin who used to be that they it's, it's quite a long story it's an interesting story behind them um they they, they a veteran player made his own team they started at the bottom of the way up became like third best in europe went to worlds and then disbanded like a year later 
Um, but then they've come back, partnered with Astralis, and they're one of the best teams again. So it's sort of like, um, but they were like, when they came back, they're like, obviously Astralis has got this big name, but they don't want to move it over to League because it's a CSGO thing. So we're going to take the Origin name because that's got huge meaning to everyone in League. Um, so it's sort of like moved over. I, I, have a, I have a question that's very specific to Counter-Strike. So with the introduction of, um, of Valorant, do you think that, that CS will take a, a big hit? Um, no, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, so first of all, I think Valorant, uh, the way that like the mechanics and the things with like abilities, it's a little bit more of an entry level. It's, it's kind of easier to get to grips with than CS can be. Um, CS with having so many players and whatnot, um, there's a few issues as uh, smurfing, which is like a whole term, which basically just means like playing at a level, you make like a new account and therefore the, the rating of that account is, is reset. So let's say, yeah. you know, you're super sick in the game and, you know, you, you're just able to play against people who are a lot uh, worse than you are. So that's kind of an issue and can be a bit off-putting. I'm sure that'll become a thing in Valorant. It is a free-to-play game, but at the moment... It's, it's already it's a thing in Valorant. Okay, well, there you go, yeah. Um, it does happen pretty quickly, I suppose. But uh, there's um, a few things. It's like, I think they're trying to battle for a, a, a newer audience, people who are put off by CS and don't get on with CS as much, because, like I say, it's a little more entry-friendly. They also, Riot, have a, a huge tap on um, the, the Asian market, um, mm. like we, we've talked about Korea and everything and, and whatnot, CS has never really made it out there. Um, I think because the Chinese government uh, particularly have their own version of um, and and League already kind of had like a big grip out there. There are more parallels between uh, like StarCraft, for example, that was massive out there and League than there are um, StarCraft and CS. Um, but I think as well, coming from CS, like having played a lot of the game, Valorant has elements uh, that CS does. But the one big thing for me is kind of like the map design is, is a little uh, hard to, to play once you come from CS, where it's been developed for years and years and years. And then you go to Valorant and it's kind of very basic. So I find that like a little uh, off -putting. Um But I think, I think the competition is healthy. It all kind of depends on how Valve reacts, um, which like they are a much slower to move kind of developers, I've said with like esports, but also with their games, they tend to let these changes lie. And if it's a problem or whatever to begin with, they'll see how people react to change it before they come in. And there was this whole thing with one of the weapons being really, really strong in CS for, for quite a while and pro players and casual players alike being like, get rid of it, like do something, this is ridiculous. It's a good six months, then Valorant comes out and a week later, they they uh, adjusted the weapon. <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it's clearly like a good thing for competition. But I think they're trying to approach two different markets. I don't think that Riot are coming in with Valorant and going, okay, let's steal everyone away from CS. They're kind of trying to pull people who want to get into those tactical first-person shooters, but maybe don't quite agree with CS. So they've, they've played CS for a bit and they don't like it. Um, Honestly, I think they're looking to pull more people from like Overwatch, for example, because of all the abilities and stuff like that that yeah. are in the game. I, I, I think on the on the, that sort of thing, I'm one of the people who never played CS in my life. I've never played FPS before Valorant. Um, I only played it because it was a um, Riot game, and obviously I'm a big Lee Lages player. Um, and as Harvey said, it's sort of... It, it's sort of I don't think it's pushing people or uh, sort of making people choose between them. If anything, it's helping the market because now I'm interested in watching other things. Like uh, I'm excited for the Valorant League to start, um, and I, I want to watch start watching like Rainbow Six Siege because that's the sort of parallels to that, and that's got quite big esports at the moment. Um, so I feel like it's sort of helping people make a transition over, as it is a sort of, as I've said, an entry level game. Okay, um, let's, let's kind of move on then to more individualistic uh, questions about you guys personally, you know, rather than the industry as a whole. Um, so a question to both of you then. When did you decide that, Harvey, you wanted to cast and Sam, when you wanted to start writing about esports? And um, 
talk to me a little bit about kind of your journeys into doing that. You know, how, how, how did you start uh, writing about it? How did you start casting? Uh, I don't mind who goes first, either, either or. Um, so I suppose if, if uh, proper origins, I was like 15, right? And, and obviously, as you guys know, I have a bit of an uh, interest in acting and everything like that. Um, so the two of them, gaming and, and acting, it, it's, you know, got the performative element to it, does, does the casting. So, um, and I remember, I think it was like something at school and uh, one of our teachers who was like ahead of year or whatever was making like a, a, a board um, of, of aspirations. And when, you know, we got given a little post-it and he was like, just write what you want to do at this point in the next five to 10 years. So I, I put like an esports commentator, even though I had at the age of like 16, 17, um, been planning on, you know, going to uni and doing my A-levels and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was kind of an end goal at, at that point. I still knew that I wanted to give this a good go. Right. Um, so that's kind of where the, the idea for it started, uh, actually with league, I followed league for quite a while. It's probably the first esports title that I played, um, to, very, very old timey commentators, uh, Joe Miller and D-Man, I was big fans of them. Found out the other day I'm literally from like the same place as Joe, which is really weird. Um, cause I saw him on Twitter using some like very specific kind of slang and I was like, hold, hold on a minute. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I watched, I watched those guys. They got me into the idea of it. Um, and yeah, just kind of from there. And then it was not until I got to uni and I had, uh, access to a bit more time, my own space, um, and a, a bit of money to get like the setup going. Um, that I kind of just, you know, looked to a few places that ran casual tournaments. One of them was a website uh, called Challenger Mode, where they, you know, you pay them or you enter their tournaments and they will set up the brackets and all the structure of the tournament. You just need to kind of supply the money, right? And obviously pay them for their service. Um, and they were doing their own thing needed some commentators. So that's where I started. And it was actually kind of a good place because they brought in a few more experienced people as well that could give me um, some really good early advice. And then, like I say, maybe um, two or three months after that, where I really started to, to get a start and um, learn from people who had experience and whatnot was with um, the Newell, which is the National University Esports League. Uh, yeah, and then just from there, you kind of have to work the connections and it's getting to a point where... I thought, you know, this year was going to be the year kind of thing. Um, but obviously, once again, uh, plans kind of uh, oh, fell right apart, now. I think, because they did for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, love it. But, um, but yeah, and, and it's kind of starting to open up a little bit. But, yeah, getting to a point where I'm feeling fulfilled and I think I can hopefully turn it into a living soon. Um, but, yeah, just the the grassroots scene i guess is is where most casters start so that's that's where i got my start as well fantastic what about you sam then well mine's a, a sort of a bit different it's i never sort of really envisioned myself going into it um into this sort of scene until m more recently um i've also i've been following league for years um i started following it when it the the the, the league esports scene used to do like a, a tour they're based in Berlin now, but they used to take their, their like, to different uh, countries. So they came to London six, seven years ago now, and we went to see it in Wembley. Um, and that was the first, that was literally the first time I've ever seen esports. It was a massive event in Wembley um, that my friend Ethan took me to. Um, and that's literally started my five, um, passion for it. So I've actually just watched it um, and kept up with the scene for about, these past couple of years and then um i only sort of progressed things this time last year uh, well sort of earlier march time they um they riot do a, a competition called eu masters which is um there's the the the, the pro league european scene is called the lec and then the step down from that is the the european masters level so it's all the upcoming talent in europe it's all the teams that are quite not good enough to be like top of europe they're all there. They're all seen how well they can do. There's, it's where the UK league comes from. It all feeds into this final thing that is the EU Masters. And um, coming back again, my good friend Ethan, um, he worked for ESO, which was the which is the the like esports company, um, and they hosted it. They hosted this competition in Leicester last year, 
and pulling some connections, we managed to get uh, press passes to the event, which meant that we got to talk to uh, we got to talk to casters, got to talk to players, we got to do interviews, we got to go see behind the stage, um, everything like that. It was just um, it was it was a big jump because it, as Harvey said, it was sort of he sort of had to build him way up, and we got sort of thrust in at the deep end kind of thing. Uh, we didn't have any experience in this before. We, we we made a website. We got to do some interviews. Got to talk to all these pro players. Um, unfortunately, if things have been, it, it had hopefully have been in Leicester again this year, uh, the final back in March, and we would have gone to it and we'd have probably done the same a similar thing. But obviously, virus happened, so everything got cancelled. Um, and we, I, I kind of. If I'd love to go into casting, honestly, but it's just trying to find the um, the way in, I guess, to try and make that step. Um, I don't really have a super uh, huge amount of connections. I've been making them this past couple of years. I've been talking to new people and everything, um, but I think my paths are sort of diverting away at the moment. But it's, it is what it is. If I can get in, I'll always try and get in, but it's, it's just trying to see where we end up. And where can people find your work for both of you? I know, obviously, Harvey, your, your alias is, is it Scrivcast? Is that am I saying that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where did you come up with that name? Um, so <laughs> the the origin for that um, when I first got my PC, uh, I was maybe like thirteen, fourteen. So I did have like a bit of time on consoles. You know, the the Modern Warfare two days uh, is kind of my my peak console playing. Um, <laughs> And uh, my alias, my, my Xbox Live username was uh, half the Marv 62, right? I was like <laughs> maybe 10 or whatever. <laughs> so when, when I got um, a, a computer, obviously that's, that's not cool. I'm like 13 and cool now, I guess, or whatever, <laughs> right? Or trying to be. Uh, so I had to come up with something a bit different and just kind of like went on Google not necessarily like a name generator, but some forums or whatever for like name ideas. Um, and eventually a bit of an amalgamation of a few that I saw came up with Scrivix um, and then dropped the, the X off the end. Cause um, I guess like internet friends as it were, or like friends of friends that I play games with sometimes, a lot of them just called me Scriv, said it rolled a bit easier. So I just, I just went with that in the end. And Sam, do you have an alias or do you do you Yeah, no, I, I did no I do. Well, so I used to for the longest time when I started up, I was I was just the Warvel, because it's quite a unco it's come common name, not many people do it. So I was like, I'll just stick with that. And I was like, okay, um I I'll I'll change it up a bit. So both me and my friend, uh, about a year ago we had a rebrand. He went from just the Hargreaves to Hooper with two uh, two zeros. I'm now a Spitfire with but instead of the second eye, it's two Ys because it's quite a common name, so a lot of people like it. So I thought... That's a cool name though, that, isn't it? Spitfire. Spitfire, yeah, I, I, I like it. Um, That's sort of, so, sort of name you take when you take a girl out on a date. You're like, well, you know, some people call me <laughs> you, my darling, you can call me Spitfire. Yeah, so I have, I have my Twitter set to... I have a separate league account that I share everything on it. So I think it's just Spitfire Casts. So that's Fantastic. where you can find me. Fantastic. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how much traffic I'm going to be able to generate to you guys. <laughs> I don't know how many people <laughs> will watch and read this. But um, that's good. I find that idea so fascinating of, of having aliases. I find it really fascinating. I, I suppose it's quite important, isn't it? Um, you don't know who's going to be watching and who's going to be reacting with you. I suppose if they did get hold of personal information, I suppose it'd be quite dangerous, isn't it? Especially kind of in this world. It's, yeah, it's, that's why I tried to try, try to um, move away from Warvel since it is so indicative of me. I mean, most people still just call me Warvel anyway. Um, like, just instead of Sam, I'm, I'm literally known as Warvel, and if people refer to me as Sam, everyone's like, "Who the hell is that?" Um, so it's I'm, I, it's trying to build that brand. So all my accounts now are just linked as Spitfire, it's just so people are like, "Oh yeah, no, that's I, I kind of know that guy." Yeah. Um, yeah Do you have anything to add, Harvey? Yeah, I I, I'm kind of, I'm just thinking it's like, it, it, it's interesting because uh, some people really go by the aliases, like obviously with all the casters and stuff that are out there. 
Um, and then others, it's kind of, it's like in, in League, I think they all have aliases, if I'm not. Yeah. It might be like a few new people. But like some people in, in CS and I think in other esports just kind of go by their name. They don't have an alias, right? So like a, a really popular pairing at the moment is uh, Anders and Moses. Which kind of sounds like it should just be two names, but it sounds like a reason. it sounds like an electro band from the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does a bit. It does a bit. To be fair, um, but Moses, his name is is Jason O'Toole, and he goes by that. But Anders is, I think it's Anders Bloom, his second name. Um, funnily enough, we've talked about Danes quite a bit. He's also Danish. Um, but yeah, and like so, some of them just have never had an alias at all, even though they've been around way longer and all the weird names with numbers and all that kind of stuff everywhere um, were very big in like the early 2000s. So not everyone does, but I guess some people it really is like indicative of their brand. It, well. League, literally everyone has a, um, a tag, except for what there's one, there's like two interviewers, the, 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 as how I was saying, the newer people who are just go by their names but um a quite a famous example is uh harvey already mentioned him was um uh joe miller who is one of my all-time favorite people um he just went goes by joe miller um and so people started because he was always uh, you get introduced with like d-man would be lee d-man smith and so people just referred to him as joe joe miller miller um and, kind of, um and there was this whole like thing on reddit about um joe just call me joe miller and then it was like joe 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 just call me joe joe miller 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 um and it just sort of expanded into this whole thing you just wanted to be known as joe miller um it's it's it's, it's a weird like thing to think about isn't it that you just yes. go by this whole, whole totally different name and people name. might not even people might not even know it's you like no. It's like, oh, I went to school with, like, what, John Smith. Um, but it could also be this really famous, like, uh, Rainbow Six Siege player, but I wouldn't know because he goes by, like, shotgun or whatever. Well, you know what? I've absolutely loved doing this. And um, I I'd love to get you both on again when you're both free and to ask more specific questions to your field. Because I'm aware, obviously, this has been a very sort of general chat about esports, you know. Um, I'll have to do a lot more research. Obviously, I'll have to educate myself uh, to be able to ask these specific questions and stuff. But before we before we call it off, one of the things that attracts me to esports, and one of the things I actually I know a little bit about, is the controversies that surrounds that surrounds the sport. And you get and it's with any sport, you know. It's it's it, it's in some ways it keeps the sports alive, having these these dramas and these controversies. So before we finish this off, both of you, what's your favourite? Um, or your most iconic controversy or drama in esports so far? Um, have one. The one that the one that springs to mind for me uh, is uh, the I by Power players. Uh, so I by Power is like a, a team. Um, the company they make PCs, right? And um, they had a team in 2014 to 2015. It was it, it kind of sticks with me because uh, the time I started getting into CS is kind of when this was all like wrapping up. So it was like all there and I had all the information and immediately like was able to, to plunge into all this like controversy and drama, like you say. Um, but basically they were playing in a league um, that the, they'd won right or they'd qualified or whatever for the finals so the game they were playing didn't really matter it was a whole thing and this is a whole years long controversy in cs again because valve are like kind of hands off and let um other organizations get involved and use their apis and blah blah, blah. um skin betting was like a massive thing for for quite a while um and you know basically in cs there's in-game skins uh, that have like different values depending on how rare they are and then people would go on this website called CSGO Lounge and bet skins on teams to win or lose and they bet against themselves and through the game right um, which apparently at the time there's all rumors and theories about other teams that did it but they were the team that got caught yeah because um, it all kind of fell apart a little bit and for some reason, the guy who orchestrated it all, who was like a better and, you know, had all the contacts, um, 
bragged to like his ex-girlfriend about it and then she just leaked all the messages and it screwed them all over um but it was it was like multi-layered because um they were a north american team at the time the north american team wasn't as good as europe um and they were like the hope as it were decent organization really good players been performing well um and then they kind of all just threw it away uh, there was uh, a guy swag who was like this really young talent he was like 17 um but anyway they eventually got like perma banned by valve from uh, again so like i say it's mainly open circuit there's the majors and there's like two of them a year and they're sponsored by valve and they tend to be the big prestige so valve were like not coming to the majors and all the other tournaments um kind of followed suit as to you know get some brownie points with with valve and and it's yeah it's really weird because the guy i mentioned him earlier richard lewis he reported on it he kind of regrets it because he didn't realize like they would all get perma banned it's developed in like 2018 some of those other organizations that had followed suit with valve decided because there are now so many tournaments going on let's unban them and try and get them back into the scene some of them came back some of them didn't some of them are going off to play valorant now for a, like a fresh slate um but yeah that one really sticks with me because there's like so much going on uh one of the guys didn't get banned because even though he was sort of part of the throw but you know he said after the fact oh, i didn't really want to do it but they were all going to do it so what choice did i have um but the skins that they'd won from like throwing had run out for now you can only transfer so many at a time or whatever so he didn't get his until it was going to be like a week later but by then the story had already broke so he was like no nah, no nah, i don't want my skins anymore and valve banned them based on those skin transfers so that's kind of interesting and then he went on to play in some really big teams but yeah so that one he actually won a major so he ended up being like one of the top players for a bit of time Wow. Uh, but yeah that one sticks with me pretty massively because there's a lot that goes on and it was very early on to me getting into cs that it happened Fantastic. What about you, Sam? Um, there's, uh, I'll, I'll be quick, but there's like two. The, there's, there's one actually happening at the moment um, with uh, League, League Team TSM. Um, so what happened was um, they, they, there's this North American player called Doublelift who's considered to probably be the best North American player ever um, of all. Um, and he's still playing. He's still really good. He was on Team Liquid last year. Um, best North American team um, but then at the end of last year Liquid start well last split so a couple of months ago they Liquid were really bad they came seventh they'd won four in a row and then they came seventh which so is a massive shock they'd not really changed anything and their star player double lift got started, started getting subbed off and everything um, so in the off season there's always a lot of roster transfers uh, he got transferred back to his old team TSM um, and he, he was replacing an AD, uh, a player that wasn't actually that bad. He was uh, really good. He had a good split. So everyone was like, okay, kind of what's happening. And he's dating the CEO of that company. I've um, heard about this. I've read about this. Yeah. yeah and uh, then there was, on one of his stream that she said something that was supposed to be confidential. Yeah. And yeah. then the, all this got out about their team, some of the other players. And uh, it's, it's part of this whole thing about how, what the, the behind the scenes of TSM are actually like. There's a lot of rumours going around about TSM um, and I'm not, I'm not really going to comment on them because I've got my opinions on that and everything. So it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's a really weird situation to kind of see how it develops. The other one that I mentioned quickly is quite, um, it's, it's, I'd say it's quite a, um, a harmful one in the whole um, retrospect of everything. Uh, so uh, in the, the Russian league, there's a Russian league, the CIS, um, one of the teams, um, as Harvey mentioned briefly earlier, they, they were all getting franchising, so everyone was buying spots. One of the teams were like, okay, so we're getting franchising next year, I'm not going to buy a spot, I don't really want this spot anymore, I'm not going to care. So what they did was they brought in a full female roster, um, and the, these, the female players weren't good enough, they were sort of plat level, which is not good enough to be playing pro that's just above me like harvey's probably about plat level so it's kind of like um highly of me uh, I, 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 I try to remember how highly how high you actually rank um my, my mate ethan's plat level so him 
it was basically like him playing on a pro team. He'd get absolutely decimated. And what they, they just brought in this full female roster for basically clout. They were mm. like, oh, look at our old female roster. And they were getting decimated every single game. Mm. And it was that kind of thing of like, you're just doing this for clout. This is r- really bad for females in esports because that is such a touchy subject anyway. Because there's none of them. There's literally none of them in league. There was one player and she got bullied out the the, the competition because of all the hate she got online. Um, and to, for them to bring this team in and basically be like, oh yeah, th- this isn't good enough. They weren't. They they were they weren't even a team. They were they all of them played the same role. Um, the and they just weren't good enough. And they got and it had a repercussion on other teams because they weren't taking it seriously. They were like, why should we play against this team? We're just going to smash them anyway. So let's have some fun. Right came along and said, oh no, you need to play properly. This is bad. This um, affects the competitive environment and they play properly and absolutely wipe the floor with them which everyone expects and it's just kind of like you've heard the, the industry a lot here mm-hmm. but for females in gaming for like the competitive integrity for all those players like they, they it's, it's like how do you feel like you just get wiped every week but no it's, yeah it's, yeah it, it's quite uh, I think it's sort of sawed out now because that team's no longer in um, around um, and their players aren't playing, but it's, it's, it was just it just annoyed me a lot. No, it can be fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, and right before we go, then just remind us again where we can find you both and where we can find both your work. Uh, so my, uh, my, my oh. Oh, well. <laughs> you go, 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 go for the plug. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, my, the, the Twitter that's got more league content and everything on is Spitfire Casts, and if you just want to see a stupid stream, um, is First Fool, which is my friend's stream, which is where we stream everything on Twitch. So come join us. We're literally on every night because we've got nothing else to do. <laughs> um, mine is uh, Scrivcasts, as uh, Josh mentioned earlier. Uh, and all my other links are around there as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this, lads. I really, really appreciate it. I've, I've had a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, um, yeah, and like I said, I'd love to be able to, I'd love to get you back on when you, when we're all free again uh, to talk more specifically about your fields, you know, and um, now we've covered all the general stuff, you know. But anyway, take care of yourselves and uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you.